I don't know, I'm sure that Halloween 6 will pay off this new ending better than Halloween 5 paid off the last ending, it won't. When the next movie hits theaters just as quickly as the last sequel did in Halloween of 1990. It actually came out six years later and everyone hated it, so they just rebooted the series over again, the Thorn Cult storyline was dropped completely, and none of the emotional investment you had in these past three movies would pay off in any significant way. But thankfully, David Gordon Green's reboot trilogy would later heal these deep wounds amongst the divided Halloween fan base. Evil dies tonight! Evil dies tonight! I want you to hit me as hard as you can. Folks, the Halloween season has fallen upon us yet again, and so has the supposed final film of the holiday's most iconic movie murderer, Michael the Sheep Myers. As Jamie Lee Curtis returns once more as Laurie Strode to ensure evil finally dies tonight in David Gordon Green's finale of his John Carpenter-approved reboot trilogy, Halloween Ends. And much like Carpenter's third Halloween entry from 1982, Green's third entry has gotten a divisive reaction from horror fans over its difference in tone and relative lack of Michael Myers, though still garnering plenty of viewers both at the movie theater and on Peacock. But speaking for myself, I don't think Halloween ends or kills are anywhere close to a new low for this series. As Awfully Good Movies has found in our previous two Halloween reviews, as well as today's review for another infamously bad installment of the Michael Myers saga from 1989, Halloween 5, The Revenge of Michael Myers. After Halloween 4's release the previous year proved successful at the box office, franchise producer Mustafa Akkad was quick to move on a fifth Halloween film that once again had the shape returning to Haddonfield to continue his pursuit of Laurie Strode's orphaned daughter and kill a few horny teenagers along the way. And with both Daniel Harris returning as Jamie Lloyd and Donald Pleasance coming back as the obsessed Dr. Loomis, then surely Halloween 5 could repeat its predecessor's success with audiences. Unfortunately, Look Who's Talking would beat Michael's ass at the box office that weekend, and the sequel's relatively weak box office was joined by a poor reception from critics and audiences, which ensured that the conclusion for this Thorn trilogy of Halloween sequels wouldn't come out for another six years, and we all know how well that turned out. <laughs> But since I thought that Halloween 4 was too good of a movie to rip apart for this show, I shall instead turn my attention to Halloween 5 and find out how it came to be known as the very worst of the Halloween sequels that came out in the 1980s, that is. And while I won't spoil Halloween ends for you loyal Joblo subscribers who haven't seen it yet, I must warn you all that there might be an end credit stinger after the movie that hints at Buster Rhymes' long-awaited return to the Halloween franchise for David Gordon Green's fourth and most divisive of reboot to date, Halloween whoops your ass. A masterpiece. Motherfucker. Well, it's Halloween, so I guess we're entitled to more than one stiff drink as we stare into the blank, evil eyes of the awfully good drinking game. Take a double shot for when the film opens by recapping the previous events of Halloween 4. Rachel Carruthers and her foster sister Jamie Lloyd run down Michael Myers, or rather his stunt dummy, with a truck. He wakes up to attack Jamie once more, and the gun-toting populace of Haddonfield shoots Michael down a salt mining shaft. But what we neglected to show you in the last movie was Sheriff Meeker and his men throwing some dynamite down the mining shaft, just as Michael has gotten away yet again in a nearby creek. <laughs> And where should he wash up but on the property of a kindly old hermit, who takes in Michael after he tries to kill the old man, but instead passes out from his bullet wounds. And the passionate love scene between these two men will unfortunately be edited for time. Then we flash forward one year later on Halloween Eve at the Children's Clinic in Haddonfield, Illinois, where who should be a patient but our girl from the last Halloween movie, Jamie Lloyd, played again by Danielle Harris, who has been rendered mute from trauma and now communicates via sign language or a chalkboard sign, 
after we last saw her in Halloween 4 mimicking her uncle's famous Halloween murder upon her innocent stepmother, and Loomis crying out in despair that Michael's evil has been reborn. A truly great ending that this sequel will surely acknowledge now that Jamie apparently shares a psychic link with Uncle Michael that awakes him to reveal his cult of thorn tattoo. Wink, wink, we'll explain that in the next movie. Thus beginning Michael's newest killing spree in Haddonfield with the old hermit. But thankfully not the man's parrot. <laughs> you son of a bitch, you shrunk my Shatner mask into laundry while I was asleep for a year? Now I look like I've got a potato for a head. But just as the doctors are about to operate on Jamie, who should save the day, but... Donald Pleasance, returning for a fourth time as Dr. Sam Loomis. I see you still want this girl dead. She has something to tell us. And who should pay Jamie a visit the next day but her sister, Rachel Carruthers, played again by Ellie Cornell. But what should interrupt this blissful visit but a rock thrown through the hospital window by the townspeople, who suspect that Jamie Lloyd is going to inherit her uncle's evil after murdering her stepmom. She is not him, she's just a child. They know that Michael Myers is her uncle, and that she attacked her stepmother, that's why they fear her. Oh, I'm sorry, attacked her stepmother. Because not only have we confirmed the off-screen stepmother survived that stabbing at the last movie's ending, Mom and Dad send her love but that Jamie Lloyd has no recollection of even doing it. Oh well, I guess we'll just have to pretend that ending never happened, and leave that whole Michael Myers transferring his evil to a younger killer idea for another Halloween timeline. I'm sure it'll go over way better 33 years from now. Michael has now traced Jamie Lloyd's stepsister over to the new place that Rachel has moved into with her friend Tina, and their pet dog Max, where they blast synth pop tunes from the stereo that sound more appropriate for the soundtrack of Jetsons the movie than they do for that of Halloween 5. Thank God that Jamie Lloyd's Michael senses are starting to tingle, and communicates furiously through her drawings over the hospital wall that her uncle's next planned target is Rachel's pet pooch, Max. Because you know as well as Dr. Loomis does how Michael Myers feels about dogs. He got hungry. Drop the phone, get out of the house. Quickly now, go on! Run, bitch! Run! But thank God the dog is okay for now. All thanks to the help of... All clear. Nothing above, nothing below. The Haddonfield Police Force's equivalent of Bulk and Skull from Power Rangers. This movie did not just try to underscore the arrival of two comic relief cops with fucking clown music on the soundtrack of a Halloween movie, as these characters were written as an homage to the wacky comic relief cops from Wes Craven's horror classic Last House on the Left. You know, the one part of that movie that everyone complained was horrifically inappropriate for an otherwise somber horror movie about rape? Well, now they're back in Halloween form. Fuck you. <laughs> Meanwhile, Loomis catches on to Jamie Lloyd's telekinetic bond with her uncle that she's struggling to explain without her voice. Tell me what you know, right, right, right? Damn, if only George R. R. Martin had Loomis as his literary agent. As for Jamie Lloyd's stepsister, Rachel, who was the final girl to survive Michael's grasp in Halloween 4, she will sadly be the first woman of Halloween 5 to die at Michael Myers' blade. No! <laughs> So on top of dropping the lingering plot thread from the ending of Halloween 4, this sequel has also killed off the fairly likable character who survived the last movie as quickly as they later kill off Jamie Lloyd in the next Halloween movie, despite Ellie Cornell's disappointment with the script's direction. But audiences will be even more disappointed when they find her place is taken by her horny housemate, Tina a manic pixie valley girl who is perhaps even a more ill-fitting addition to the Halloween series than either Busta Rhymes or LL Cool J. Gonna miss you, baby! But I guess she decided to go up to the country with her parents. Oh, oh Max! Shut her canine trap! Yes, Tina is stupid enough to think her friend went off to her parents' house without packing any of her belongings, so she just heads out to meet with her equally insufferable friends. There's Samantha, who's the blonde one. I've just been in a weird mood all day. You guys can have the house yourself. It's cool. It's way cool though, huh? Then there's Tina's lunkhead boyfriend who also happens to be named Michael. Michael! What? Oh, I'm sorry. Wrong Michael. Sorry about that. I got confused. Uh, keep pretending I'm not here, girls. And finally, we have Samantha's boyfriend, Spitz, the other blonde one thus completing this film's terrible quartet of dumb young horror movie bait who pad this movie out with some incessant jibber-jabber. 
Nice wax job. Touch the car again and you're dead. You're gonna get high blood pressure, Mikey. Pick me up at 8 at Rachel's, okay? Ooh, baby, does it turn you on when I make my voice sound like I'm speaking through an empty paper towel tube? I am rooting for Michael to pick off all four of these Saved by the Bell rejects in quick succession. Beginning with Andrew Dice Stamos over here. Okay, asshole. You wanna play? Trick or trick! Aw, but you killed him before he got a chance to say, Motherfucker. <laughs> However, there is some copious atmosphere and style delivered by the sequel's lengthily named director, Dominique Otnon Gerard. I just wish that he made that same effort towards the script as he did the visuals. With Gerard dramatically throwing the script into the trash can in front of Mustafa Akkad, as it was not belonging to the essence of Halloween, and left the movie to roll into production with an unfinished script that leaves the movie in an endless pattern of Jamie either spazzing out from another epileptic fit, and Loomis then assaulting the girl in increasingly furious and unintentionally funny fashion. We both know he's alive. But you know where he is! What about your stepmother, Jamie? What do you think he's going to do with that? Huh? Okay, how is it that Loomis has not been banned from this hospital yet? If this is how he treated Michael as his patient, then no wonder that kid got fucked in the head. That's not to say that Donald Pleasance doesn't keep acting the shit out of these monologues he delivers to either Michael or Sheriff Meeker over the film's course. I prayed that he would burn. In hell, but in my heart, I knew that hell would not have him. Or that Daniel Harris isn't still great herself in the part of Jamie Lloyd. After all the screaming and crying and running for her life she's had to do for these past two movies, it's nice to see her find happiness for once with a stuttering boy that befriends her at this hospital named Billy. It, it's good luck. But while her and Billy take part in a goblin costume pageant, where none of these kids are dressed like goblins, Jamie is struck with another vision of Michael's next planned murder on Tina Williams, as he picks up the girl posing as her now dead boyfriend while wearing his Rudy Giuliani mask. Oh, I can't resist your new look. Hey, this trick worked in the first movie, and you can't go wrong with the classics. Although Michael is far more helpful towards this girl than he was to PJ Souls. Stop the goddamn car! I want a pack of cigarettes! Psycho boyfriend. Well, I'd say that Michael's side career as an Uber driver is starting off surprisingly well. And so Jamie falls into another fit on stage, where Loomis is finally able to hear her regaining her voice to tell them where Tina's about to get killed. Store. Big woman. A big woman? <laughs> Cookie woman. Cookie woman. Cookie woman. Yes, of course. It's just as I thought. The cookie woman who adorns the giant cookies billboard in Haddonfield. She is the one who's been controlling Michael's evil this entire time. We must gather all the police force and shoot down this cookie woman six times before sugary death comes for your little town, Sheriff. Forget Sesame Street. Haddonfield is now home to a real cookie monster. God damn you, cookie woman. <laughs> Now that Tina has been rescued and reunited with the newly talking Jamie, Tina? she'll surely do the right thing and stand guard over this poor girl while Michael Myers is still at large. Or she can do the stupid thing and go out to a Halloween party with her pals, only 10 minutes after the town's entire police had saved her ass. Jamie's a nine-year-old girl! Be sensible. I'm never sensible if I can help it! Tina, follow her then! If that girl dies tonight, then this movie would actually be significantly better in quality. Uh, you know what? I take back what I said. That girl dies tonight! That girl dies tonight! You will die tonight! So with the two wacky cops trailing behind Tina as she joins Samantha and Spitz down at the kegger, and Jamie escapes from the hospital with little Billy so the two of them can save Tina, this is where the movie loses any tension it hoped to build off the surprisingly decent Halloween 4. Because Tina and her buddies are the actual worst, especially when it comes to playing pranks on these two dumb cops who are the second to worst. She's a virgin. Got her phone number? You think that's funny? Just a little Halloween prank, okay? Definitely not funny. Oh my god, Spitz. That was hilarious, the way you almost got killed by a cop after mocking the brutal murder that continues to haunt our town's history for over a decade. This costume was way better than your Jeffrey Dahmer idea. 
Now we're just farting around in a barn with these three jackasses as they play around with a box of kittens, walk around the barn calling each other's name as bad horror movies do when they need to pad out time, and keep pranking each other with cheap jump scares. <laughs> Oh my god, Michael Myers was William Zabka this entire time? That guy really did play the villain in every other 80s movie. Samantha and Spitz's sex scene marks one of the first times that a horny couple in a horror movie practice safe sex. But then Michael finally returns with a pitchfork to ensure that one broken condom does not lead to these two dipshits creating some equally obnoxious children. <laughs> Just so you know, this one is totally not a prank this time. But while Jason or Freddy could overcome a terrible script with some memorable kills, the kills in Halloween 5 seem so very tame by comparison. Hell, the two wisecracking cops we wanted to see die from the moment we heard their theme music do not even get an on-screen death here. No respect for authority anymore. It's the parents. Yeah. <sighs> Bullshit. The only reason we should have spent so much time with these unfunny cops was so they could meet a brutal death at Michael Myers' super strong hands. Take these characters back to the David Gordon Green Halloween movies, where they also don't belong. So that leaves Tina alone to discover her friend's lifeless bodies, and finally catches up with Jamie and Billy just as they must flee from Michael driving behind the wheel of her boyfriend's Camaro. Jesus, this is the most depressing Naked Gun title sequence I have seen to date. I love it! The addition of John Carpenter's original Halloween themes also helps amp up the suspense here. And in the movie's best creative move of all, Tina sacrifices herself for Michael to help Jamie get away. <laughs> thus ending the life of a deeply annoying horror movie character who has redefined the term hate sink. Farewell to thee, Tina Williams, and your 80s Agatha Harkness hair. You will be dearly missed by people other than myself. So Dr. Loomis catches up with the two kids and finally gets Jamie's help in luring Michael Myers back to the place where his murderous rage had begun back in 1963, the abandoned Myers household. Have you come home? Michael, I know what you want from her. Yes, I'm aware that it looks like the Adams family has remodeled his house in between sequels, but look, this house was the best that we could find on short notice, so just work with it, okay? Donald Pleasant certainly is. It will destroy you too. This rage. His rage. Which drives you. You have to fight it in the place where it's strongest, where it all began. Michael, go home. Go home! Go to your house! You'll find her waiting for you. Oh, I'm sorry, Dr. Loomis. I had my earbuds in and couldn't hear you. Could you repeat what you said? God damn you, Michael! No, I'm just kidding, Doc. I'll see you back at my place. And for this final showdown, Sheriff Meeker has brought in plenty of cops ready to take the shape down once Jamie lures him back to his old home. Because as the trailer promises, This time, they're ready. We just had a distress call from the clinic. All mobile units, proceed immediately to the Madison Clinic. Run away! Run away! Okay, I take that back. They've just been called out to investigate a possible break-in at the children's hospital, which was just a diversion for Michael to finally make his way past the cops. Ah! This time, they're ready. Ah! Yeah, ready my ass. Son of a bitch! Charlie! Michael Myers is outside. Stay with the little girl. I love that Loomis has now reached Nicolas Cage at the end of Wicker Man levels of insanity here. Because his storyline of a man who's gone insane from being tasked with containing the very embodiment of evil itself is the only thing about these next three sequels which pays off in a meaningful way. Let me take you to her. She take your rage away. You don't need that. <laughs> Got <him. laughs> Meanwhile, Daniel Harris gets little to do in this third act except more screaming and crying and running from Michael. This isn't moving forward any of the plot threads we needed answers to. What about that guy dressed in black who arrived on a bus to Haddonfield earlier in the film? Is he any relation whatsoever to Johnny Cash? What about that tattoo on Michael's arm? Is he going to be inducted into the Stonecutters? Just because I know the answers to these questions from watching Halloween 6 does not mean that they are questions I should be having about this sequel's story when we're only 15 minutes away from the credits. 
Jamie finds herself in the attic where Michael has built a crude display of his murdered corpses. And she hops into the coffin that Michael has ready for her when what should stop him in his tracks, but... Uncle! Man. Yes, folks, Michael Myers is ready to be the murderous psycho uncle that his poor niece has never had. And this is when we make good on the trailer's promise of finally showing the unmasked face of Michael Myers. This time, he's unmasked. Who is played in Halloween 5 by stuntman Don Shanks. Well, I mean, you really can't see Michael's face too good in the dark here, and I'm pretty sure we got a pretty good look at his face back in the first movie, but okay, sure. This certainly fits with the director's intention of making a more human version of Michael Myers. Strong men also cry. They're just like me. I already said this to Rob Zombie about his Halloween reboots. We do not want to see a more human or sympathetic version of Michael Myers. When you give him a sympathetic motivation and remove the mystery away from him, then he's just like any run-of-the-mill psychopath in any run-of-the-mill horror sequel. Dr. Loomis is arguably more frightening in this final act than Michael has been this entire movie. Let's play a game. <laughs> Catch the little girl. Come on, get your little girl. <laughs> Loomis lures Michael into a steel net where he shoots a tranquilizer gun that will surely not- <laughs> Well shit, that went out the window. Better just whack him with a 2x4. Die, 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 die. Yes, this supernatural psycho who in previous films has survived multiple gunshots and a fucking hospital explosion is surely going to meet his maker by being beaten repeatedly with a wooden board by a 70-year-old man. Was this Loomis's entire game plan for the past 11 years? Sheriff Meeker and the cops return to rescue Jamie and haul Michael away to a jail cell, where he will spend the rest of his days while still being allowed to wear his Shatner mask for some reason. No, Bob. Knows the trouble I see. But what's this? That man in black arrives at the police station and sets off an explosion. And after getting into a shootout with Dick Tracy, the man in black makes off with Michael Myers, and Jamie cries out in despair that Michael Myers' evil will live on to haunt Haddonfield for another Halloween. No! Kind of a bummer way to end this episode. And just like Halloween 4, we're once again left with a twist ending packed full of questions. Will Jamie get captured by Michael Myers once more? Yes, and she'll end up getting raped and impregnated by her uncle as well. Will we find out what's up with the tattoo on Michael's wrist? Yes, it turns out to be from a druid cult that's controlling Michael Myers with the help of evil star magic. And who is this mysterious man in black? It's the mustache guy who ran the hospital in the first movie. I don't know. I'm sure that Halloween 6 will pay off this new ending better than Halloween 5 paid off the last ending. It won't. When the next movie hits theaters just as quickly as the last sequel did in Halloween of 1990. It actually came out six years later and everyone hated it, so they just rebooted the series over again. The Thorn Cult storyline was dropped completely, and none of the emotional investment you had in these past three movies would pay off in any significant way. But thankfully, David Gordon Green's reboot trilogy would later heal these deep wounds amongst the divided Halloween fan base. Evil dies tonight! Evil dies tonight! With Halloween 5 still listed as the franchise's lowest grossing entry, it has little to offer for merely casual fans of these movies. Its script is largely aimless, its scares are virtually non-existent, and the characters we wanted to follow from the previous movies are shoved aside or abruptly killed off for some seriously annoying comic relief. For what little it does offer, The Revenge of Michael Myers doesn't quite hit the bottom of the barrel, but it can be easily skipped during your own Halloween marathon, unless of course you're watching it with the Joe Bob Briggs commentary over on Shudder. Now, if Dr. Loomis can be brought back from the dead to the Halloween series, then there's surely hope for Paul Rudd as Tommy Doyle to be restored to the Halloween universe in time for its next reboot in a couple of years. No! No! On the Enjoy of Boonness continuum scale from Boulder Bruce, Halloween 5 The Revenge of Michael Myers is the most disappointing return to the screen for Mike Myers since his latest Netflix series and throws its corpse into an industrial shredder to change its shape into a 4 out of 10. If you truly think that Halloween Ends is the worst death that this franchise has ended on, then you don't know what death is. 
I'm Jesse Shade for JoeBlow.com, wishing all of you the happiest of Halloweens, and thanks for watching our show. If you like what you see, please subscribe to the Joe Blow Originals channel, tell all your friends who like this sort of content, and turn on the bell to receive notifications for all our latest videos. We are an independent company that appreciates all of your support. Now, if you'll excuse me, I'm going to be busy this Halloween having some business to attend to. <sighs> Michael Myers is a killer shark.